A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Paul left, left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. He went to visit them, and because he practiced the same trade, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Every Sabbath he entered into discussions in the synagogue, attempting to convince both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began to occupy himself totally with preaching the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your hands. I am clear of responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to a house belonging to a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next to a synagogue. Crispus, the synagogue official, came to believe in the Lord along with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians who heard believed and were baptized. Verum Domini. The Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. The Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wondrous deeds. His right hand has won victory for him, his holy arm. The Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. The Lord has made his salvation known. In the sight of the nations, he has revealed his justice. He has remembered his kindness, his faithfulness toward the house of Israel. The Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation by our God. Sing joyfully to the Lord, all you lands. Break into song, sing praise. The Lord has Dominus Fabiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Gloria Jesus said to his disciples, A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while later and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What does this mean that he is saying to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they said, What is this little while of which he speaks? We do not know what he means. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, are you discussing with one another what I said, a little while and you will not see me, 
and again a little while, and you will see me. Amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will become joy. Verbum Domini. There are certain areas around the United States who are today celebrating Ascension Thursday as a holy day of obligation. And there are other areas in the country as well who have transferred the feast to next Sunday and celebrate the Feast of the Ascension next Sunday. Whatever part of the area, you, the country rather, you may be located in as you watch this broadcast, it is true for all of us that we are now really entered into the liturgical season where we meditate on the ascension of our Lord into heaven. All of the, all of the scripture readings of the past several days uh, have been uh, uh, depicting our Lord, telling his disciples, telling his followers that he was soon to leave them, that it was better indeed that he did leave them, that once he had left them, he would send the Holy Spirit of truth to them. The Holy Spirit would teach all things. Even yesterday, we... Uh, we had our Lord, if you recall, telling his, telling his followers that uh, he had much more to tell them, but they could not bear just then and there what he had to tell them. And so the Holy Spirit was going to tell them. And we made the point, of course, that, uh, that the Holy Spirit, through the church that our Lord began, has been telling the followers of Christ ever since. So most certainly we prepare then for those glorious events, whether we celebrate them today or Sunday, our minds are very, very much fixed and set on the ascension of our Lord into heaven. According to one particular scripture account of the ascension of our Lord into heaven, the last gesture that he did was to give a blessing to his followers before he ascended. The 11 had gone, as Christ had told them to, from Galilee uh, to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is really just a stone's throw, if you will, from from the city of Jerusalem. On seeing our blessed Lord, the risen Christ, once more, they fell down before him as their master and their God, and they worshiped him. And remember now that he had, at that point, a glorified, perfected, and exalted body. What precisely do we mean by a glorified, perfected, and exalted body? I don't know about you, but for my part, I've not the remotest scintilla of a clue what it is, because no one who witnessed our Lord recorded very precisely the, the exact nature of his physical countenance after the Heavenly Father, through the cooperative work of their Holy Spirit, raised our Lord physically and bodily from the dead. But we do know that his entire countenance was entirely different than it had been prior to his, uh, prior to his resurrection from the dead because so many people did not recognize him. Mary Magdalene, remember, thought he was the gardener. Uh, those who were closest to him walking along with him on Easter Sunday afternoon on the road to Emmaus had not a clue who he was until their minds were opened by a particular phrase that he uttered. And so his countenance was very different from what they had known him. But nonetheless, he had by now been with them for 40 days. And so they were used to the effulgence of his glory, the radiance, the radiance of his person. And after those 40 days spent in his company, they could be witnesses clearly of what they had seen and what they had heard. The Holy Spirit was now going to confirm in them the teachings of Christ, and the Holy Spirit would lead them to complete and total truth. We see the beginnings of that very shortly after our Lord left the world with the first council of Jerusalem in the church, as we have seen subsequent councils over 2,000 years. What, what, has, what has been going on, of course, is this constant and absolutely incessant work of the Holy Spirit guiding the body of Christ, guiding the body of Christ homeland to the final fruition at the end of time. Our Lord had told his closest followers that the power they received was absolutely a sharing in his own power. They received the power to forgive sins, 
They receive the power to bring about a rebirth in baptism. They receive the power to change the elements, the accidents of bread and wine into the substance of his body and blood. All of these things were, and indeed to this day still are, a sharing in the power of Jesus Christ. He did that, of course, when he ordained the first 12 priests of the church on that Holy Thursday evening. And ordinations of priests have been going on in the church and will go on in the church until the end of time. So the mission of the church, my dear friends, as we follow this logical sequence of events from the leave-taking of our Lord right to the very present day, the mission of the church is to continue always the work of Jesus Christ, to teach people divine truths, and not only to teach them divine truths, but also to teach people the very, very real demands that those divine truths make in the lives of each and every one of us. He said to them, recall, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And being his witnesses to the ends of the earth means bringing his message to people in all known corners of the earth and bringing it fully and bringing it clearly. No sooner had he said this, no sooner had he assured, as St. Matthew tells us, he, and no sooner had he assured his followers that he would indeed be with them until the end of time than a cloud we read in Scripture took him from their sight. A cloud which St. John Chrysostom described as a sign that Jesus had truly entered heaven. So if this period of the Ascension, this feast which we are either celebrating today or will celebrate on Sunday, if this feast of the Ascension does nothing else, it strengthens and it nourishes our hope of attaining heaven. It gets us thinking, if you will, of the homeland that awaits each and every one of us, unless, of course, we personally decide to forfeit the homeland by by a free conscious misuse of our own will, by totally turning away from God and living our lives accordingly. But you see, the Lord himself has that homeland in store for each one of us. He would not want any of us not to reach the heavenly shores. If people do not reach the heavenly shores, they have not reached them at the end of their lives, purely because they made a decision, I don't want to reach them. I want to do things my way. But for the overwhelming majority of us, I dare say, this period of the liturgical year does focus our minds and our hearts on the idea of attaining heaven. It invites us always to lift up our hearts, sorsum corda, as we say so beautifully in Latin. Our hope is very great, my dear friends, because Christ himself has gone ahead of us to prepare that dwelling place for us. We have today, we have today, wrote St. Leo the Great many, many, many centuries ago. We have today ascended mystically, but also really to the highest heavens. We have won through Christ the gra a grace more wonderful than the one we had lost. Pope St. Leo the Great puts it very well. We are on our way to heaven. The Italians have a very beautiful expression for it. They say, già ma non ancora, already but not yet. There is already a part of us that is in heaven. And until we reach those heavenly shores at the end of our days, where do we find Christ now? We find him mystically present in his church. We find him truly present in the sacramental life of his church. We find him par excellence in the most holy Eucharist. As we therefore prepare for our homeward journey, however long it may take us, uh, time-wise in earthly measure, to arrive at those shores. We have a wonderful chance to be extraordinarily close to him while we are making our pilgrim journey in this earth, to the extent that we cultivate our love for him in the most blessed Eucharist. And if we concentrate our efforts in that area on loving him most particularly in his church, we will indeed reach that heavenly homeland safely. We will reach that heavenly homeland well, well prepared to love him. And please God, each and every one of us will reach it at least 30 minutes before the devil ever finds out we're dead. God bless you.